This is Bonjour Chai, the It's Hard to Say I'm Sorry edition. I'm Avi Feingold in Montreal, and I'm here with Melissa Lansman in Toronto and Alana Zakon in Vancouver. We are your Frozen Chosen. Hey. Hello. Happy Yom Ha'atzmaut to both of you. Guys, hello. It's Yom Ha'atzmaut. Israeli independence, 73 years young. Um, what, what do you guys Never think? Never looked so good. <laughs> Never looked so good. What's your what's your Canada Israel like when you think Yomatz Maud or you think Israel and Canada together like what's your you know skating no. how many how many of you have ever been skating in Israel just because it's a thing I think it's just you you know there's like one skating rink like in the north oh well and none of the, us no I've never no I never even did it no no it's not my thing no I just none of us perfect yeah I'll, I'll start I mean I remember the first time I went to Israel, I was I was on the first ever birthright trip, December of 1999, and I discovered that there was one second cup in Israel, and it was right off of Ben Yehuda in Jerusalem, and that became like my place for like two was, weeks. Just was that like, the secret meeting spot for all of the Canadians? Like they just, they just went yes. there? Yes. Oh, yeah. It became like an insider thing. There was clearly a lot of Israelis there, but all the Canadians knew that that was the second cup, and that was like 20 years ago when the second cup was cool, when it was like not even Starbucks wow. yet. Wow. What a world. I remember going to a lot of the parades in Montreal growing up. It was one of the days where we got off uh, from school and we'd go out in bus loads and then you'd bump into every single person you've ever met in your life on the streets. Kind, kind of like Ben Yehuda. There you go. The second cup, but I'm sure there were many second cups in Montreal. <laughs> I got I got to share this with you. I um I worked for uh for for Prime Minister Harper yeah. and when I think of uh when I think of Israel, I think of a trip that we once took there and Every time uh, you did travel with the prime minister, certainly at the end of his term, there was protests when you landed. And I'd never seen anything like this, but the plane landed and there was just people with placards, you know, calling him out, saying like, welcome, uh, yay, Canada. Uh, this probably was one of the that he was uh, popular at the end of his term, but it felt really good not to come into a protest and to come into uh, to cheering. That's my Canada connection. Did they think that because he was he was in Alberta that he was bringing them oil? Is that why they were like all cheering him? Perhaps. He was like going to pull pull stuff out of his pocket, like little bags of like like oil and like morality and uh, nice things. <laughs> no, I don't know. Like I feel like you know this this idea of Canada and Israel being allies. Like we you know it's weird we were talking about this in our in our pre meetings we, we we discovered that canada doesn't currently have an israeli ambassador um, but that's i mean it, it happens to be like looks like a bureaucratic oversight at the moment that like somebody's done and nobody else has taken over yet but are you like, is this is this your application for the job no 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 i don't think i please. you heard it here on bonjour chai no but i feel like we go back we go back like we have these like deep ties we go back to the beginning of israel uh we go back to before the beginning of israel canada supplied stuff to the haganah before like the, the country was founded underground right um you know my dad told me stories about like how there were um uh, Bronfman would send uh, soldiers, like young guys from Canada that wanted to fight in Israel. And he would send them to to his his connections in New York, but, you know, like people named like Meyer Lansky and people like that, who would smuggle them in boats underground, not underground on boats, but like the proverbial underground to Israel to fight. Um, and, you know, nowadays we see this as like the equivalent of like going to fight ISIS, but like that was the good fight back then. And I mean, it still is, but like, this was the path that you had to take to go fight for your fight for for the nation that you wanted and canada had a big part in that um mm. you know canada sent arms can, under i mean canadians i shouldn't say canada officially but there were canadians that sent funds that sent arms to canada to, to israel in the founding and we all the way to this day when we have people like you know sylvan adams who a good proud montrealer uh who who represents israel like in such a big way globally he's the guy that brought madonna to, to Israel. He's the one that wanted to bring the Giro d'Italia, that big uh, bike race to, to Israel. I don't know, like we have connections. It's, it's, it's a good thing to be Canadian and Israeli and, 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 oh, and, got, and Jewish. Yeah. We've got deep connections. When was the last time you were both in Israel? Melissa and I have never been in Israel together. <laughs> oh, that's... No, no, no. Individually. No. <laughs> uh, when is the last time? Uh, it's been a couple of years for me. I think it's, I think that's a good reminder that it's time to go back. How about you, Avi? Um, I was there uh, November of 2017. I led a trip uh, for an organization called Honeymoon Israel. Have you ever, guys ever heard of Honeymoon Israel? It's, it's, Is that the one that's like birthright for couples? Birthright for couples. It's, it's even like more that. explicit about making Jewish babies. Right, right, right. The agenda is strong. <laughs> 
The agenda is strong. Yes. <laughs> that makes it sound like a dictatorship. I didn't mean to say that. Apparently, it's a great trip. I only heard about it a couple of years ago. That was not one that they promoted when I was in high school. <laughs> Well, it's only it's only been a few years and that they've been around as oh, an organization. It's, new. it's okay. relatively new. It's des specifically designed for couples. You have to be in a love relationship. Right. Like, so you've got you've got ten days to make a baby. It's a little longer. I think they have like I think it's yeah ten or twelve days. And uh, some people already have babies. I mean, there there are married couples that show up also. Um, we did a we did a tenth year anniversary for the couple that I was one of the couples I was on the trip with on the top of Masada. Um, and it was beautiful because because uh, they had never been to Israel wow. and or one of them had never been to Israel. And this was like their way of like, you know, recommitting and doing something beautiful, like within the relationship. And they, they they came and it was it was a magical moment. But like Honeymoon Israel was an interesting trip. But that was I think that was the last time I was there. I basically as a rabbi, you, you tend to only go to Israel when other people pay for your trip. Right. <laughs> just like politicians. That right, That's just just like just like students. Uh, and then it's those, and then it's visiting those friends who decided to get married there. Uh, so you're taking, you're taking random trips. Anyways, um, before we get to our first topic, let's hear from our first sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Atelier Lou Bijouterie in Westmount, Quebec. Atelier Lou specializes in custom-designed jewelry as well as many lines including Anzi, Deacon & Francis, Dana Bronfman, and many more. If you're looking to upgrade that engagement ring or pop the question, come talk to Eric and design the ring of your dreams. Atelier Lou is offering a promo code for all Bonjour High listeners using BON18, B-O-N-18 at checkout for 10% off your order at atelierlou.com. That's A-T-E-L-I-E-R-L-O-U.com. So it seems as if Jews were in the news a lot lately for, you know, violating mass protocols and curfews here in Quebec. Uh, opening schools in Ontario when they're not supposed to. Uh, there's also a growing sense that there's not much confidence in vaccines within the Orthodox community. With us to talk uh, about this, to get a quick update on uh, with his efforts to get the community vaccinated is public health physician and pandemic expert, Dr. Barry Pecos. Dr. Barry, how's it going? Hello, I'm all right, how are you? Doing all right. <laughs> what is it about certain subgroups of populations and not just, let's say, the Jewish community that are prone to this kind of thinking, you know, that certain things don't apply to me, that I'm better than the rules or I'm different? You know, I, I can, you know, carve out these exceptions. How do we go about educating a community without preaching? Well, there, there was a lot of questions there. It, it, you know, vaccine hesitancy, um, like many things throughout this entire pandemic, are, are social constructs, right? So they're, you know, it's less about the vaccine, it's less about an intervention or public health measures, and more about how individuals see themselves as part of a community, how individuals see themselves as, as related to the community around them. So, you know, what you did point out is that certainly among um, many Jewish groups, particularly, um, uh, you know, Haredi or ultra-Orthodox groups, but also, you know, others across the spectrum, um, there is sort of a, a, a clear countercultural um, mindset, which, you know, which is, has kept us as a people for many thousands of years. Um, and there are, you know, really important good parts to that, both in terms of networking, community, and, and, and social infrastructure. And, and then there's negative parts of that, which, which um, are, are, you know, as we're seeing with some vaccine hesitancy, it's, which is, you know, skepticism of what governments uh, or, or, you know, others are telling us um, uh, when, when in fact that skepticism is not warranted, or at least not that degree. So, you know, um, overall though, I mean, to say that there's vaccine hesitancy in the Jewish community, I think would be an overstatement. I think um, uh, in almost all parts of the Jewish community, most certainly including Haredi or ultra-Orthodox folks, um, you know, th there is relatively little. There are certainly groups that have much more um, vaccine hesitancy, you know, in particular, um, Black Canadians uh, and, and specific subgroups of Black Canadians as well. And, and that is also for very good reason uh, and, and part of a social construct. I, I have a question for you. How do you how do you get by them? Because I think there's lots of people who listen to the messages. You don't blame them because the the messages around vaccines have been ever changing, malleable, uh, maybe not so clear. What are you doing uh, to uh, to work on that? So, um, I mean, firstly, they they actually haven't been that unclear. You know, um, it, they're you know in terms of the public health messaging around the public health measures or you know vaccines. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of things we've done uh, less than well in this in this pandemic, but messaging around those things or the conflicts are, you know, I think really overstated. Um, you know, the the first couple of months when we suggested people not use masks, that wasn't a, a, an error in public health science. That was very intentional because those masks were needed by others. You know, the wiping down stuff vigorously, you know, that was done out of an abundance of caution. But pretty quickly, like at last April, we knew that people didn't need to do that. And and in terms of vaccines. Um, you know, it, the vaccines that are currently available have gone through all the normal procedures, just, you know, a bit faster. And, and really that rapidity is due to the fact that there was all this funding and all this disease out there. So they've sort of met all those metrics. Um, and right from the get go, the evidence has shown that those vaccines are really very efficacious and safe. Um, so, you know, people understandably somewhat hesitant and lack confidence. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is people who are actively seeking to undermine things. And, and right now in Toronto, there are many, many people who are getting phone calls telling people that people are, thousands of people have died after getting the vaccine and that it will definitely impact your fertility and all kinds of things. So that's not, you know, that's not hesitancy, that's not a lack of confidence and that's not confused messaging. Those are, you know, truly evil people who are calling um, Jewish households um, with those messages that are, you know, very, very dangerous. Most people are just hanging up on them. That's how I know about it is because people are sending us, you know, those clips. Um, so, you know, those are those are the elements. So in terms of increasing vaccine confidence, which was really your question, it really is about just finding people in the community who people are, trust and, and whether those are doctors or rabbis or others. Um, and using them as ambassadors. And we do that in the general community. We do that in the in the Jewish community. And there are lots of people um, who are doing that. We did that in, in Toronto with a measles vaccine campaign. We had a whole bunch of rabbis being vaccinated on camera. And, you know, it, it worked really well. To be honest, there wasn't that much hesitancy. A lot of that in particular was just, you know, people with large families, it's hard to get out and get everybody vaccinated on time. And people came out in droves and, you know, a thousand people came to be vaccinated. And so really the, the main issue right now, to be honest, is is uh, vaccine availability. And right now there are leaders in the Jewish community, you know, myself included, who are arranging small pop-up sites here and there to get people vaccinated. Um, you know, we could get the entire Jewish community vaccinated in four days if we actually had enough vaccine to do that. So, you know, our real challenge now, to be honest, is not vaccine hesitancy, it's, it's supply. It will become, you know, potentially getting those last bunch of people vaccinated at some point. And there are some diehards in there, but it is really a small group. And what's your prediction? If I can change gears a little bit, do you think we'll be sure. able to do Passover in person next year without uh, any restrictions? Next year. So, next yes, year. <laughs> next year, I think we can. I mean, we are just today. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of your listeners are listening on the day that this is created, but, you know, it is a very bad day today in Ontario. Um, you know, our, our cases are higher than they have ever been. Uh, I, I presume it's the same in Montreal and, and other urban centers and, and ICUs are, you know, you know, 50% more over capacity than they ever were during the first or second wave. So, you know, we are in a really bad place right now and it's going to be four to six weeks at least before we get out of it and we're hoping there won't be a fourth wave you know there probably will be sort of a a fourth trickle maybe in the fall like a flu-like illness but you know next pace up um i think everybody will be vaccinated and being able to you know uh gather in person and, and i'm actually hoping for rosh hashanah and yom kippur and sukkahs this year even better will be um you know more or less okay we're you know it is not going to be back to normal but it's far closer to normal than we are currently experiencing. That's my hope, but, but you know, every day brings a, a new, new challenge, a real new challenge, and that certainly includes today. For sure. I, I think there's, I actually think there's something that you can, uh, you can help with, particularly to our, to our listeners. And I, I, I mentioned a muddled message because you're seeing some brand preferences amongst vaccines. I don't know if that's prevalent necessarily in the Jewish community or across the board, um, but just, I mean, set the record straight here. Here's your opportunity. Yeah. Um, is one better than the other? Does it matter? Is it just good when it's in your arm? Right, so here's the thing. Um, you know, the, the, the overall public health messaging is which vaccine is best, the first one that's available to you. Absolutely. Um, but within the Jewish community and many other groups, and, and, and this actually does vary with sort of your perspective on individual versus collective and your place on the political spectrum, and, and most importantly, the media that you're reading. You know, in, in my experience, the people who come up to me when I'm walking around the neighborhood, 
who with sort of, you know, not conspiracy theories, but some unusual stuff, they're reading a particular newspaper. Uh, and when I ask, there's not one I read, but when, when I ask them, where did you get that idea? You know, they're reading that newspaper. And so it's, it's partly coming from, from there. But, you know, why I mention that is this, this relationship between individual and collective is really important. So if you're asking me, you know, what vaccine is best for me, what vaccine has the highest efficacy will protect me, then, then yes, Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, and, and, and the Moderna vaccine are, you know, somewhat higher efficacy. That's, that's certain. But your risk of getting COVID is not about what vaccine you have and not even that much about behaviors. I mean, you need to you know, do the right thing. It's about the prevalence in the community and what everybody else is doing. And so the most important thing is that everybody get a vaccine as quickly as possible and everybody need to recognize their role in doing that. So that is why no matter what vaccine comes, if, if AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson was available to me first, there is no question that I would take it. Um, there are these, you know, very, very rare uh, events that are occurring. But again, if you look on a population level like I do, you know, those are important. We need to think about those. There's a pause on Johnson & Johnson now, and that's, you know, perfectly reasonable. On the other hand, on the individual level, do you need to worry about that when you're getting it? Absolutely not. I mean, you are far, far more likely to get in a car accident and die while you're driving to the vaccine clinic than, than have any untoward effects from the vaccine at all. And so there's, you know, the two sides of the individual population coin. So I want to wrap it up a bit because um, it's really trying to get an update, but I do want to take it back to the Jewish community a little bit. Um, what, mm -hmm. the, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the public health issue that I'm seeing is, your, as you're right, less so about the ha vaccine hesitancy and much more about um, disregarding rules, saying that schools should be open. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw in the news this week, but UJA has uh, stated that they're pulling funding from one of the schools for uh, for opening. In, oh, I am in, aware. <laughs> so um, is that a good thing? How yes. do we actually go and because to me, that is the much bigger question, right? The, the the public health questions around the Jewish community are much more around gathering, around minion, around this, around that, saying, I don't care what the government tells me. My rabbi tells me that this is more important. Right. So, you know, absolutely, that is that is happening. And that is very, very, very concerning from a whole, you know, lot of perspectives and it should not be happening full stop um, the you know the the reason that this tension arises between you know let's say the the biggest issue which is you know kids in school and kids not in school and the biggest argument is uh, aside from that the government has mismanaged this and that is true and they are not listening to public health as they should be in Ontario but you know the biggest thing is you know the mental health impact on kids and and really the biggest contributor to the mental health challenges in kids is that the many schools who are refusing to close haven't provided any alternatives to those children. So, you know, in the other 30 schools that are transitioning back and forth between virtual and, and in person, um, you know, it's, it's not great to have your kids virtual for many months at a time. Um, but, you know, they, they are learning. They are they are learning secular subjects. They are learning Jewish subjects. And in fact, in many ways, for me as a parent of five kids, it's actually been a wonderful experience to see my kids doing that. Um, you know, those schools um, have a legitimate, you know, um, uh, complaint against the government and that they're not funded at all uh, in any way, shape or form. And they feel that they should be the ones making the decisions about what's going on. If they if if they're not getting any money from the government, why do they have to be listening? Um, and, and, you know, that part is somewhat reasonable. What is not reasonable is that many of their decisions and the way they're behaving um, are not based on a, 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 a political consideration or wanting to be countercultural. It's actually just misunderstanding of the facts. Um, the, the gathering together in schools is incredibly dangerous right now. Um, and we have seen rates in the Jewish community that are tens of times higher than anywhere else, the highest in all of Canada uh, from our estimates. We don't collect them in terms of public health, but we, you know, we are aware of them. Um, and so you know, that is an incredibly significant issue. There are people in the ICU, um, young people uh, who have been affected because of transmission in schools. And so um, there are ways to do it safer. You wanna keep your schools open in violation of, of the rules. Um, you know, I think that is a very bad idea. But if you want to do that as well as not using masks, distancing and other tools that can protect the kids, that's a different conversation as well. That's not buying into the whole thing. And that conflict between what kids see and what parents see in the outside world 
and what they're being told by their rabbis and people who they have, you know, find have authority. That is really what causes the mental anguish in communities, to be honest. That's really tough because because they're seeing that and they're growing up. And then that's where the distrust of public of public officials comes in 10, 20, 30 years is when they say, I listened to my rabbi and the government when I was younger was saying, you know, yeah, it's not 10, 20, 30 years. I know you have to end here, but but I am not that worried about the pandemic effects in those communities as much as I am worried about the long term social effects on those communities in Canada, in the United States, in Israel and elsewhere, because those things are, you know, we're going to recover from this pandemic, whether it's in a couple of months or a couple of years, but that stance, what, what, what they did now and that, you know, what that sets up in terms of a social dynamic is very, very concerning for the entire Jewish people. I hear that. Well, I hope that message comes across to them from you. And I hope I know that you're working with them closely. Um, and we thank you for that work. And uh, when there's an update again, uh, I hope we can catch on count on you to come back in and uh, give us an update. Sure. Happy to do that. Thanks so much, Dr. Barry Pekis. In September of 2000, a young, very naive, not very smart, Avi Feingold assumed the co-presidency of Concordia University Hillel. Little did he know that the year would spark unrest on that campus and way beyond reaching universities across the world. And while the activism around Israel engagement and the BDS movement has only intensified in recent years, Concordia University's student union surprised everyone with a statement recently that apologized for fostering a campus culture where Jewish students are afraid to openly identify as Jewish. With us to talk about this today is Nikki Nashen, a CSU counselor and incoming Hillel president, so I'll pass the baton along to you, uh, as along with Harrison Kirshner, one of the CSU counselors uh, whose brainchild this all was. Uh, Nikki Harrison, thanks and uh, welcome to the show. Welcome to Bonjour Chai. Um, can you walk us through, you know, because most people got this on their feeds uh, last week and it was shocking to say the least. Uh, clearly, this wasn't something that you guys decided to do in one night uh, and the next morning put this out. Uh, walk us through the process of how uh, this started and where uh, until where it got to today. So Natan Sharansky's three Ds of anti-Semitism are demonization, delegitimization, and double standard. Demonization is over-exaggerating the scope of Israel's actions to vilify it. Delegitimization would be saying that Israel does not have the right to exist, and double standard would be applying a different standard to Israel than to another mm. country. I've never heard that before. So I'm, I'm, at, I'm, I want to jump in because I'm going to take the uh, the skeptic role, which uh, I think many who saw this uh, have been on campus. You said the last 20 years. I certainly was on campus. It hasn't been a great environment. It hasn't been a great environment since for for fostering. This kind of uh, this kind of Israel bashing, but talks a bit cheap. What happens? What happens next? You know, apologies are easy. Uh, action's really hard. Um. So I think one thing um, that we've already done that's really really great is removing BDS from our policy. Um. And in addition to that, we had an anti-Semitism training where Sija actually came. Um, and educated all counselors and execs and anyone involved in the CSU about anti-Semitism. And it was through an anti-oppressive lens, because that's really an ongoing theme in the CSU is anti-oppression. So approaching anti-Semitism from the lens that we see other forms of oppression, I think was really a way where counselors predominantly in progressive spaces, student unions are predominantly progressive spaces, were able to understand anti-Semitism from that perspective and understand how to combat it because it, it's approached in a way that it makes sense. Yeah. So what is something that you learned from those trainings or, or something that you can offer our listeners if they're um, encountering anti-Zionism conflated with anti-Semitism in their university campuses or in their lives? How do we protect ourselves? Um, so what I typically do, first of all, is I'll never assume that someone is intentionally being anti-Semitic. I think the vast majority of people are misinformed. Um, and when anti-Zionism is lumped into the category of all other progressive movements, like, of course, Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ plus people deserve rights and, you know, anti-Zionism and indigenous rights. And when it's all lumped into the same category, you don't really stop to question any of them because, of course, all these people deserve equality. Um, but I think that when we take a step back, 
okay? I don't think that you're coming at this with ill intentions, but I want to explain to you why, as a Jewish person, what you're saying is harmful to me. Um, and then you go and you explain, well, this is who the Jewish people are. We're actually a group of people that come from the land of Israel. That's who we are. And we were colonized and expelled into the diaspora. And that's why you have Jews that come from so many different places. But what actually binds us all together, what makes us one nation of Am Israel, is the fact that we all come from Israel. So saying that we don't have a right to that land, that is the purpose of who we are, that's why that's anti-Semitic. And people are kind of like, oh. <laughs> wow. So essentially, um, this this has kind of been um, going on for, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Avi, for, year, for years where we've had um, a... Uh, anti-Semitic environment um, at the CSU and at Concordia in general, more more like it, it, it happens in classes, it happens in the CSU. And what ended up happening was, is um, we uh, have recently um, actually uh, removed certain positions, including BDS and other positions that were no longer relevant to the student body. So it's, I mean, if I can, you know, take a step back and the the theory behind a lot of the anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism that happens on campus or on the left, so to speak, because there's a lot of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on the right as well, um, but we're talking primarily because that was the For issue sure. here often, um, is is that intersectional thinking, intersectional politics um, places, um, you know, anybody in terms of an oppressor versus the oppressed, um, and that the uh, individuals are, um, you know, that if you are perpetrating something, then you are, um, you know, th then you are somebody that we are going to push away. We are going to, you know, in enact sanctions, you know, no matter how small they are, whether it's BDS, whether it's, you know, at the national level, whatever it is. Um, what you seem to have succeeded in doing is pointed out that there is no oppressor and oppressed when it comes to Israel and Palestine. There is just other. I don't even think it goes that deep. I think that that you can have whatever opinion you want on policies of the Israeli government. You can even say, you know, I don't agree with annexation. I don't think that that is a good policy of the Israeli government. You can also say that about the U.S. I don't think that the U.S. should annex Montreal. You can say that, and that's not anti-U.S. You're not, you're not mm -hmm. demonizing citizens of the states. Um, so I think that in making the distinction between critiquing a democratic government, which is a fundamental tenet of democracy, and vilifying or demonizing or placing double standards on the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. I think when you make the distinction between those two things, that's when people start to realize, oh, well, mm -hmm. I can still have opinions and critique the government. I just can't harm Jewish people. Where has um, where has the pushback been? Um, so what I've found, and not even so much from CSU counselors specifically, just people in general, say, well, if I can't have BDS, then what can I have to advocate for Palestinian rights? Um, and I honestly don't really have the answer to that. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know of another movement or another organization yeah. that advocates for Palestinian human rights that doesn't um, use anti-Semitic tropes in doing so specifically. But I think that grassroots awareness raising, like you can, you can post on Instagram. This is why I don't agree with annexation, or you can post on Instagram. This is why I don't agree with this certain Israeli policy. Um, and that's really different than mobilizing behind an organization that has actively harmed Jewish students on campus. Do you think it's possible to have um, BDS and still be not anti-Semitic? I don't think that necessarily anyone that is involved in BDS is anti-Semitic. I would rather say that they're misinformed. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that if you're made aware that BDS is anti-Semitic, you should find other ways to advocate for your beliefs without harming Jewish students in the process, because I don't really think that that's, that really goes along with social justice. Social justice is advocating for marginalized and oppressed people. So it doesn't really seem very progressive to advocate for one group at the expense of another. J just to add on to that as well, like when we approach BDS and like explaining to people that may support BDS from a progressive lens and explain that for Nikki and, you know, even myself going down generations, we would not be here today if it wasn't for the protection that, that Israel offered us and for actual, you know, Zionism to an extent. Um, and Nikki and I, you know, will sometimes explain that to people and they're very receptive when it comes to that. Um, 
because it, it, it enables them to kind of, yes, we'll still fight for Palestinian rights, but we'll also not silence you and we'll hear your concerns and we'll listen to you and we'll fight for Palestinian rights in a non-anti-Semitic way. And that's the way that it uh, These that are it really be. amazing tools. I know for myself, I actually didn't go to university. I only did a, a three-year professional uh, training at CJEP because uh, I studied theater. And so I've only heard stories about these instances, um, but in my own life, being in my late 20s, I often encounter these kind of issues and I just have started to remove myself from these kind of settings because I didn't know how to um, approach it in a way that felt safe for me. So I'm just wondering, you know, are, are these tools something that Concordia has talked about making available to the public? Because, you know, student politics do happen in, in a bubble. And so maybe there's something that the greater Jewish community can learn from what's going on at Concordia and the other way around. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely think that perhaps as a Jewish community, we haven't been equipped with the proper tools to practically combat anti-Semitism. We learn about theoretical anti-Semitism, yeah. but that's not really the type of anti-Semitism that we encounter in our everyday lives. So I think that we really need to improve um, workshops and, and educating young Jewish students and young adults in general um, well, what do you do when someone comes at you with BDS? What do you do when someone tells you that you're an apartheid colonizer? Because nobody really ever tells us how to deal with that. Yeah. But there are very uh, logical ways that you can combat and respond to those types of comments where you're actually educating people as to why what they're saying is harmful and how they can improve upon that. Yeah, totally. Another question that I had is a big issue in universities and in student government is institutional memory is really short because of student turnover and students graduating. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to future students, Jewish and non-Jewish, to ensure a lasting impact? I'll, I'll just say that um, conversation conversation is important and although when we when we originally start um, these conversations may feel scary um, and we may be scared to in, in, engage in these conversations personally I was shocked to see that people actually were receptive and I received a positive response from people that I would never expect to receive a positive response from because often we are taught and we are told you can't approach these people you can't talk to them you know it's not a safe for you it's not safe but when I did it anyways because I felt like I had no choice sitting with them you know um and and just you know I, I, this goes for Concordia students as a whole um most people are receptive and most people once they learn what anti-semitism actually is um they are receptive to it so it's important that we do have those difficult conversations sometimes but also that when we're having those conversations that we approach them in a pause in the right way um and and when we say in the right way it's not necessarily you know you you're wrong right like no uh, but it's talking about, you know what, I am a Jewish student and th these are the, the, this is what I've experienced on campus. These are the forms of anti-Semitism that I've experienced. And there's a way to do what you want to do, but in a non-anti-Semitic way. And sometimes it it can be negative, um, the ways that we, that, you, that, 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 people approach things. And um, once that's explained, people are often receptive. But if that conversation never happens, then, well, things are just going to continue as they have been. So, uh, so, you know, when I was, I, I mentioned at the top that I was a former president of Concordia Hillel. Um, I don't know if you know the ancient history of, of where everything started and how everything worked. Um, so September of 2000, I come in to become the, the, the Hillel president. And I think that like there's no real issues on campus. I'm going to do a few tables and, you know, in the hall building. I'm going to do a few Shabbat dinners, maybe a Purim party and stuff like that. And then the first week on campus, Ariel Sharon walks on the Temple Mount. And this sparks uh, the beginning of the Second Intifada, right? This, this major wave of violence. Um, and I become weekly, on a weekly basis, I am in the office of the Dean of Students, um, with members of the CSU, with members of the SPHR, the Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights. And um, it is, it, it's tense to say the least. Um, but I can tell you that any time I was at um, Reggie's, is Reggie still a thing even? Is Reggie's around? 
<laughs> yes, abso- absolutely. Reggie's is strong. Um, whenever I was at Reggie's and, and there was somebody from the quote unquote opposing side there, we would argue, we would sit and we would talk and we would be like loud, um, but we'd have a beer and we'd be sharing and we'd be talking. And that it was never a moment where we thought that we w- shouldn't be dialoguing with each other in this way. Um, and it sounds like that sort of like fell out of favor where nobody was really talking to each other. And now that the favor is coming back right now that the, the conversations are coming back, that that's where things are happening. Uh, you know, uh, you're 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 100 percent right yeah. now. So then what I would ask uh, as a follow up, if you are expecting to or hoping that you can educate the people that you're having conversations with on the other side, what are they educating you guys about? What is the current state of people who are dialoguing with Palestinians are, are the ones or the CSU or, or the BDS movement? Is there um, is there a recognition um, that it's not it's more nuanced than we used to think it was? Um, tell us a bit about that. So. Uh- I'll jump and then Nikki can add if I'm missing anything. But uh, basically, um, from the conversations, not only with with Palestinian students, but with people that fight for Palestinian causes, um, uh, you know, whether it be independent Jewish voice students, etc. Um, uh, from my understanding, the BDS movement has uh, n- reduced in its impact over the years and i think that a lot of right now a lot of people um particularly at concordia are realizing that we do care about palestinian human rights but maybe bds isn't the best approach to go about it um and uh so they do teach us and i have learned a lot and i know nikki has as well we've both learned a lot um about um you know the other side and understanding what it is that we want and often we what it is that we agree on because we agree on probably what nikki 70 percent, 60 percent of the of, of of what more even of of what uh, you know of what what they're presenting to us and uh, and then they agree probably the same amount so you know what I think we're, we're united and we have the same goal in the end <laughs> Nikki do you have anything to add yeah I think that first of all approaching it from us being on one side and them being on the other side is the first problem um, if we keep saying that we're opponents then we're never going to come to an agreement and you know, we're in that land and they're in that land and neither one of us is going anywhere. So we might as well see each other as a community um, and one that's going to progress together and come to a solution together rather than continuing to see each other as opponents because that's not going to be what brings us to peace at all. Um, So instead of going into a conversation saying, this is my enemy, um, I like to go into conversation saying, this is someone that maybe has different views than me, and we probably agree on a lot of things, and we can probably educate each other so we can come out of it having better understandings of what the other one thinks. I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in here with um, with a question because it's no surprise to our listeners that I'm I'm one on this panel who believes that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. They're one and the same. And by I'm going to ask you a question by putting a line between them um, and delineating one and 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 the other. Uh, are we fueling uh, the ability to, for, for students to galvanize around anti-Zionism? And do you think that Jewish students are equipped um, to deal with something like that? I think that anti-Zionism is 100% anti-Semitism. People just don't understand what anti-Zionism is, and that's why they identify as anti-Zionists. Yeah. But once Very you explain true. that Zionism is the purpose of Judaism, why do we pray to Israel? Why do do we do anything that we do in Judaism? It's because we're praying to be reunited in our homeland of Zion. So once people understand that the ultimate goal of Judaism is to be reunited in our homeland, well, I mean, you can't really separate Jews and Zionism. Jew- Jewish people, our goal is Zionism. Our purpose is Zionism. But that anti-Zionism saying, I don't agree with this policy of the Israeli government is not anti-Zionism. You can think that Jews have a right to to their indigenous homeland without criticizing, you could criticize the Israeli government. You just can't say Jews yeah. don't have a right to that land because that denies us our right to self-determination in our indigenous homeland. To be fair, to be fair, there are many Jews that are not Zionist. Yes. And, uh, uh, and, I'm not going to say they're anti, but there are many Jews that are a Zionist. There are many Jews that are anti-Zionist. Yes. 
But and, and I think that something important to understand too is people have the conception that being a Zionist means you're anti-Palestinian. And what Nikki and I have always done and have always gone in our approach is made that differentiation clear. Being a Zionist does not mean that we are anti-Palestinian and being pro-Palestinian does not mean that you have to be anti-Zionist. Um, the two are not, uh, you know, they're not homogeneous. And honestly, if you're against one, then you're not really helping the situation at all because we're not going to solve any problems by thinking that half of the people are, don't have the right to live there. We're not going to have peace that way. And we've seen it on both sides that people do, you know, tend to state that. And uh, yeah, that gets us nowhere. So this is, I mean, and I'm sure you guys have come across this um, in your media over the past week or speaking to people in general. Um you know, there, the classical understanding, right, of the past, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years again, of Zionism um, is that we don't think about what's going on with the Palestinians. We don't address that issue. We are about Zionism. We are about Israel. And that the other side felt like they haven't been hurt at all. And what you seem to be presenting is a much more nuanced picture, right? Have you have you come across this, that, that the older generations have this perception of what Zionism is, and they really don't understand what Zionism means for people, let's say, under 40, definitely people under 30. Um, can you articulate what Zionism means, right, let's say, to the average Concordia student, to the average population um, of people in, within your cohort, uh, whether in your university or other universities, what does Zionism mean, and how is it nuanced, but still very Zionist? Because I think it's important for a lot of people who don't really get what that nuance is. So first of all, Zionism is not the modern political manifestation of Zionism that a lot of people think it is. A lot of anti-Zionists think that Zionism started in the 40s, and it didn't. Zionism is as old as the Jewish people. As long as we've been praying towards Jerusalem, we've been Zionists. The purpose of Judaism is Zionism. Um, and so Zionism is the belief that Jews have the right to self-determine in our indigenous homeland. Now, there's political Zionism and labor Zionism and different modern manifestations of Zionism, but Zionism itself is the belief, it's only the belief that we have the right to self-determine in our indigenous homeland. Um, and I think that is, when when people understand that that is the definition of Zionism, that's the definition that Jews have defined for Zionism, we have the right to determine our own self-determination movement, we get to define that, another group does not get to define that, then people can have opinions, again, on policies of the Israeli government, but they cannot oppose Zionism based on our definition of what it is, because that would mean that they don't think we have a right to live in our indigenous land. But that's not a very nuanced, I mean, where, where's the nuance there? Where's the recognition of the other side? That's what I'm curious about. Because I think that people, the perception is, if I can just uh, uh, sharpen that point, the perception is amongst a certain generation of Zionists, let's say, is that as soon as you acknowledge the very existence of another side there, right, you become a radical lefty. Right. And that's clearly not the case. So help help us out here. Of course. So I'm a Zionist. I also recognize that Palestinians have been living in that land for a very, very long time. Um, and I don't think that those two beliefs are mutually exclusive. I am a proud grandchild of Israeli citizens. My mother is an Israeli citizen, and I'm very, very, very proud of that. I also recognize that before my grandparents were fortunate enough to take refuge from being expelled from Yemen and Morocco in that land, there were other people living there. And so that nuance is important in, especially in progressive leftist spaces, where I don't need to denounce my Zionism to acknowledge the fact that there were other people there. I'm a proud Zionist. That's a fundamental part of my identity. And I also acknowledge that there are other people that were there and that are still there that are do not have very good quality of life right now. And that do the ad activism on their behalf is important and is necessary and i i'm not anti-zionist in saying that i still believe that i have a right to my land i still um, i'm so grateful for my connection to my land i'm grateful for the fact that i literally would not be alive today if it wasn't for the state of israel i might i would not exist if it were not for israel and those two beliefs are not mutually exclusive. And I just want to say too, uh, to use kind of an example of, of Canada, right? Um, and although, um, like like Nikki was saying, and, and you know, it's fact, I think that the Jewish people are indigenous to, to Israel. So this, this, this um, explanation that I'm using is a little bit different, but you could say I'm proudly Canadian while still standing up for indigenous rights, right? Here in Canada, you could say I'm a Zionist while still standing up for Palestinian rights and, and still acknowledge 
acknowledging, right, that um, that yes, it was originally Jewish mm. la land. Yes, we were expelled. Yes, when we were expelled, uh, you know, society evolved and people developed. Yes, we then, uh, you know, had the privilege and the opportunity to return to our uh, our homeland. That being said, uh, when we put aside the struggles of the people that were there in between um, and say, you know what, you don't have a right, you don't have a right to this land, you don't have a right to this land. Well, I think that's also problematic and we have to understand where they're coming from to work towards a mutual kind of conversation. And I also think that that approach goes against Jewish values. Like if we believe that we should love everyone as we love ourselves and we believe that everyone should be equal, like Jewish values are standing up for all human rights. It's tikkun olam. So to advocate on our behalf at the expense of another group also runs counter to Jewish values. The only thing that is really constructive and and aligns with Jewish values is advocating for both populations to live in peace and harmony. Thank you. Um, any last comments? Any last things? Where we go from here? What does the future look like for you guys? For Hillel, for CSU. I'll talk CSU, and then Nikki can talk uh, Hillel wise as well. Um, so. From CSU, I think the future is looking bright. I mean, we've we had the apology happen. In the apology, we we had concrete actions that we are going to take. And myself on the executive next year, um, as well as my team, I know that we are all committed to fighting anti-Semitism on campus in the CSU, as well as any other form of discrimination that occurs and treating anti-Semitism equal to other forms of discrimination that occur. And um, we will make sure that, uh, that we are training our counselors, our our senators, our judicial board members, our clubs, how to deal with anti-Semitism on that campus. And I assure that it will be somebody that is recognized by the Jewish community or the majority of the Jewish community. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about it, Nikki. As a CSU counselor, I'm very excited to be part of that continuous movement. Um, and as incoming president of Hillel Concordia, I'm really looking forward to fostering partnerships with other clubs. Um, I'm really looking forward to reaching out to other clubs, especially of minority communities, um, and both celebrating our cultures um, and heritages and traditions, and also talking about the discrimination that we face on campus and our co collective liberation. Um, I think that all of that is really, really important yeah. things to be doing as Hillel Concordia. Yeah, I think it, it, it really invokes a potential for greater change within Montreal itself and within Canada, because, you know, anyone who now will go to Concordia and learn these tools, we'll be able to take that out into the world. So thank you so much. It, I'm really moved by this whole conversation. I'm going to, uh, I'll take the opportunity to, to thank you and say that you've probably done a huge service to uh, the university in terms of its enrollment. And uh, I hope that that service extends to, uh, to the Jewish community uh, on campus and to Jewish students on campus. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Nikki Nashen and Harrison Kirshner, uh, both CSU counselors and uh, people that, uh, two individuals that were really looking to uh, change the uh, dialogue on campus at Concordia University. And I think hopefully um, have succeeded uh, to some extent. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Before we move on to our Nachas of the Week, let's hear about our other sponsor this week, SecureSure. SecureSure is the leading dealer in TELUS by ADT Security in Canada. They will protect your home or business from coast to coast with rates as low as $27 a month for a complete security system with camera. All installations are virtual. They send you an installation kit and have technicians on the phone and online to guide you through the process at your convenience, regardless of your time zone. Use promo code CHAI to get a bonus offer at no extra charge. That is promo code CHAI CHAI when you contact them via their website at secureSure.ca or email them directly at info at secureSure. Use CHAI in the subject line. That's info at S-E-C-U-R-A-S-S-U-R-E dot C-A. Let's move on to our Nachas of the Week. Melissa, what's your Nachas of the Week? All right, well, you're, you don't often hear a conservative lauding a Supreme Court justice in, uh, in Canada, but a Canadian is going to Harvard and not, uh, there's lots of Canadians that have studied at Harvard, Harvard uh, law, but never a chair. So Justice Rosalie Abella, she is uh, renowned in certainly the Toronto Jewish community, the Canadian Jewish community, the longest serving Supreme Court judge. Uh, she is retiring. Uh, and she's going to take up a, a, a chair at Harvard and she's going to do some some more of that work here in uh, in Toronto. So I, I think that's uh, worth a mention. Definitely Nachas worthy. Alana. 
My nachas. What's your nachas? My nachas is I heard about the news of a possible remake of Fiddler on the Roof, which they announced, or there was an article about it on their 50th anniversary of the movie. And um, my mom sent it to me saying, do you know if there's a way you can get an audition for this? So any listeners out there, if you have connections, there you go. You heard it live. <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof has always been a, a really uh, deep, personal Jewish movie for me and, and my family. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, Fiddler. It's uh, it's, tradition. it's tradition. Are you going to bring, what, what Canadian-ness can you bring to, tradi- to, to like Fiddler? My accent. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. Um, what canadian You're going to change bring? the town name from like Anatevka to Cap Danatevk? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Not a good idea. All right, you go. Uh, yeah, turn. so um, I'm, I'm a few weeks late to this, um, but there was a wonderful doc on uh, CBC Gems that's out there on CBC Gems now called uh, Utraman Hasidim, um, and it documents the uh, referendum that took place in 2016 in uh, Utrema, which is a borough in Montreal, uh, which has a significant population of Hasidim, uh, as well as uh, French Canadians, and the tensions that highlighted with them. And, uh, it, you know, I wasn't planning on dealing with this in terms of conversation, but it really intersects with what we were talking with, about earlier, uh, in terms of how dialogue and conversation really um, is the driving force between rapprochement um, within that community and within just about any community. So it's a wonderful doc, you should check it out. My friend Mindy Pollock, who is a city councillor, is a uh, high in that film uh, a lot of like cool funky mile end Montreal sort of like things just show up um, go check it out uh, uh, Utraman Hasidim on CBC Gem and of course before we close out let's take a moment to hear what Bubby Golda has to say there are lots of things going on in the news in all of Canada for all of the Jews you might need some help to digest the press here's what Bobby Gold Bonjour, hi, my name is Bobby Golda, and today I'd like to talk to you about how we can be inspired by Israel to embrace change. As many of you know, we are celebrating Israel's 73rd birthday this week. To commemorate the big day, there was an article posted on the Canadian Jewish News Lounge entitled 73 Fun Facts About Israel, where there was, well, 73 fun facts about Israel. I was quelling while reading these points, and one of them tickled my fancy the most, and that is that Israel is the only country to have revived a dead language and made it the national language. I'm sure we've all gotten used to Hebrew being used in our homeland, and that we can often hear it here in Canada as well, spoken in the streets from time to time. And while I always love hearing this language, I think I have taken it for granted that it has been revived, that it is only a new thing of our generation where we hear it and speak it. Oy, what a huge accomplishment! Not that I want to age myself, but I admit as the years go by, it can be hard to try new things. It often feels easier to simply accept things the way they are. We are used to our routines and ways of life, and even when we don't like it, we might kvetch about it, but we still don't really do anything about it. It gets harder and harder to move our tuches and break a schwitz. But I'd like to use Israel as our role model here for having the chutzpah to dream big and to follow through. We can think about this in regular life, but now even specifically with the fakak, the COVID, we've been faced with new challenges. Not only about protecting our physical health, but our mental health. For how can we keep our sanity when our regular routines and life have been disturbed? Well, I say, let's look beyond our regular routines. Let us think about what is meaningful to us, what do we desire at its core, and then let us have the bravery to seek it out in new ways, ways that might be unknown to us. Yes, it is scary if we require using new technology to correspond with one another or discovering new activities that our bodies won't be used to. But think of the rewards. I didn't know what Zoom was before either. And I didn't know that I can share my opinions with my kinderlach out there on this podcast broadcast tchotchke. But look at me now. I'm thriving like any good bubby should. There is not necessarily a clear guideline of how to accomplish our dreams and have our needs met. If Israel is the only country to have revived a dead language and make it the national language, then they could not have been following any model. They had the dream and chipped away at it one step at a time. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do today. 
Choose one thing, one positive change or project, big or small, you would like to see, and move along one bubby shuffle at a time. Surround yourself with support. Keep believing in the dream, even when the end is not in sight. There's something rewarding about even working on a dream or a project, no matter how it ends up. This is what can help you keep your mental health youthful, aside from oil of Olay. Mazel tov, Israel, and Chag Sameach to everyone. May you all find the strength to take a risk, follow a dream, make a change. Shalom! And that's what Bobby Golda says. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for Thursday, April 15th. Our producer is Michael Freeman, technical production by Andre Goulet. What Bobby Golda says is a creation of Adina Katz. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. Subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a comment and a rating on the platform of your choice. Let us know what you think about our discussions on the CJN Lounge on Facebook. I'm Avi Feingold. I'm Melissa Lansman. And I'm Ilana Zakon. 